All right, here we go. So uh, thank you very much for watching this. This is the Growth Ring Arbcast now on YouTube. Um, this is the first episode, so if we have a few teething problems with technology, please bear with us. No. Um, if you've seen the, if you've heard the other podcast on uh, uh, Anchor, uh, what we're doing here with the Growth Ring is Arborist Personal Development, and um, we'll be doing some chapters out of the Growth Ring book, and then we'll be also doing interviews with people from all walks of life all around the world who are doing tree work and getting their perspectives on different things to do with safety, personal development, personal growth, and some spirituality thrown in there. Um, today, we have uh, a guy that I met two years ago now. I'm just going to start up this podcast over here. And here we go. So welcome to the Growth Ring. Uh, I met this guy two years ago at a splicing class. Uh, his name is Martin Penrose, for those of you who don't know him. Um, I showed up in uh, British Columbia for a splicing workshop with Tree North Industries out there. Stuart Witt, shout out to Stuart, Natalie. Um, and uh, this character walked into my splicing workshop. This bearded, scruffy looking dude. And, um, you know, all appearances, a regular tree guy. But as he kind of sat down and kind of got sorted out, I began to realize that uh, one of his arms was a prosthetic. And so in the back of my head, I'm cataloging information about each student. And I'm thinking to myself, I have not had a one handed splicer before. This is going to be interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. And, uh, I had my fears a little bit in the beginning, my doubts that he was going to be able to pull it off. But as the course progressed, this guy outspliced everyone in the room <laughs> with one hand, and he did it with humor, he did it with grace, he did it with intelligence, and uh, an energy that just stuck with me um, from, from that day forward. So the next year, you can imagine how excited I was when I saw he signed up for the Fids and Fibers five-day workshop, and I knew he was flying from D.C. all the way to my house to spend five days with me and 25 other splicers. And uh, he just made that experience a joy. Um, so uh, there's a lot of arborists who are my favorite arborists, but Martin's one of my favorite arborists, and that's why I wanted to have him on the growth ring first. Um, and, uh, so I'll get, introduce you to Martin. Hey, Martin, how's it going? Hey, Dave. Oh, you make me blush with such an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've been saving that for you. Uh, I'll still cherish it. <laughs> so that's a little bit about how I know Martin. But I have a couple questions for you. Um, let's start off with what's your full name? Uh, Martin Penrose. No middle name? No middle name. I was expecting something like Excalibur or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, my, my parents blessed me with no middle name, so I generally just go by Martin. Fair enough. There's God, Jesus, Madonna, and Martin. Where were you born? I was born in a place called Concert County Durham in the north of England. Beautiful. <laughs> How long did you live there? I was there for five years, so I was only tiny, and then my, uh, my dad was in the army, so he moved down to the south. Well, we all moved down to the south. Uh -huh. So we are down in the sunny bit, yeah, while the rest of my family stayed up north. Uh -huh. I was down to the south, I moved around there for a number of years within the, the few towns there. And then How out to sea. How old were you when you came to uh, British Columbia? I've been in BC for three years now, yeah. and uh, I just figured out that I was 38 the day before yesterday. Not my birthday, I just worked out that's how old I was. Um, I've kind of forgotten my own birthday, or my own age. How long were you doing tree work back home? Um, seven years. So I would have been in and around trees 
for about seven years. I started out into college and started on a uh, um, like a conservation program where we started working on the riverbanks and doing tree work there. Yeah. Um, but all different sorts of things, but tree work was the one that I wanted to do. So I can't account it from the beginning of there. That's when I started volunteering with the local council. Yeah. So you're coming up on like 10, 11 years doing tree yeah, work. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Yeah, and I love it. A pure addiction. So tell me what's special about you. What's special about me? Oh, that's a tough one to say about yourself, eh? Right? Um, <laughs> what is special about me? Well, I guess I'm probably the only one-armed arborist that most people know, certainly that I know. Uh, <laughs> I think there's some others that yeah, are coming along, uh, but I'm definitely the only one that I know of myself, so I'm a, a pathfinder, a trailblazer. That's, you know, yeah, absolutely. People's arboriculture. So, um... How did you come to, to lose your hand, or did it come that way? Uh, no, I was born with it. It was a gift. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, it popped out, and it was a surprise to everyone. I had no hand. Um, generally, I'll tell people that it was an alligator, or I was picking my nose, and I got my fingers stuck. I'd bite my fingernails and chewed my fingers off. Um, you tell that to little kids, and you can see them instantly go, oh, I'm never going to pick my nose again. <laughs> you got to have some fun with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I tell people all sorts of stories, but the truth is that, yeah, I was born with that one. I never had one, which is probably the best way because then I've never had to get used to having no hat. Exactly. So you're used to it from day one. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, where, in your, where in your family did you get your sense of humor, mom or dad? Uh, I know them both and neither. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure where my sense of humor comes from. Perhaps one of my aunties, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, Very my parents cool. are the funny ones. <laughs> <laughs> so what what made you decide to do tree work? Um, my wife. I was quite happy being at home, childminding the kids and playing Xbox and doing the fun things. And she said that I had to grow up and I had to do something with my life. And apparently being happy wasn't a career. So uh I got told to do something, so she pulled out a whole load of college perspective forms, um, and she threw me one that was to Merris Wood, and then just outlined everything that was in the college and said, look, you've got trees, and there's tractors, and chainsaws, and sheep, and there's you know, farmyards, and all sorts of fun things. That, that doesn't even really sound like a college course. And sign me up. Um, so I did that for two years, and every day was different. Every day was a dream. Um, to start with, it was pretty hard, but, uh, you know, having been out of education for so long and then at uh, 26, 27 going back to college, um, up until then, I probably hadn't written more than a hundred words since I left school in 96. Um, the pen and paper is just not something you use outside of school, right? True enough. Um, so it was pretty hard getting back into the education side, but once you got over that first hurdle, everything else just become amazing. Um, and, and every day at college, well, most people probably have been to college somehow, um, but every day was different. There was always something different to do. And it's like, if it was a job, it would be the best job in the world. Uh, fingers crossed, one day I get to that point of being able to return back to college, but as a teacher, and then uh, carry on having this amazing life and the best job. So who taught you how to climb? Um, that was a collection of people. Um, and it was mostly a collection of people scratching their heads going, I don't know. <laughs> the amount of times that I've been told, well, have a go and see what happens. Yeah. You know, that's kind of it. Um, nobody, nobody's ever been able to tell me how to do um, what I do because they don't do it with one hand. And the right. general rule is everything you need to do, you do with two hands because it's safer. So I guess the real answer to that is myself. Um, I've watched other people, you know, I've asked questions, I've, I've gone to the University of YouTube, um, I've done all them bits and pieces, uh, and it still comes back down to how can I slightly change something so it works for me? Um, and then it's just seeing how all these different things come in. I want to very, very, very first start, I tried to climb the prussic system. You imagine having one hand and holding the rope, and you pull yourself up, then there's nothing to slide the prussic up. So I can get one pull up and that's it. 
side note to that, foot locking, that's exactly where I still am. Well, I how can about... up once, and that's it. <laughs> then I stop. I mean, it blows my mind just thinking about tying a presser with one hand. Tying, yeah. you know, <laughs> tying a new with one hand is a daunting task. Right, right. So There's, do, you, uh, do you think one of your special qualities is patience? Um, maybe. I swear quite a lot. Yeah, maybe he's behind the beard so not everybody else can hear it. I'll be <laughs> doing whatever. Um, everything's kind of my way, you know, like tying hitches, whereas everybody else would have two hands out and be doing it. Whereas, you know, what you can see, this hand is for waving. That's pretty much what it does. And turn it that way, I can karate chop things. Yeah. Other than it's pretty useless. So for the most part, I'll be holding things into my chest with like almost my elbow. Yeah. So uh, I'll be doing everything real close. Um, so there's ways and means around everything. Yeah. Um, but once, uh, as I go back again, uh, when I was climbing, I was trying with that crust. It was just the hardest thing in the world. And then um, I got a, oops, then I got a zigzag. I started playing with a zigzag, and all of a sudden, everything just started clicking because the uh, the self tending on it and everything else that came with the zigzag and just the ease of pulling stack. Whoa! And then as, as you start to learn all the other bits of amazing gear that were in arboriculture, like a foot ascender. And you slap one of them on and all of a sudden you don't really need hands. Your hands are just there like hooks to hold you into the rope. So yeah, I played around with that for a little while and you kind of learn your own system, you learn the way to get it. You know, there's, there's bonuses and you know, pitfalls to all of it. But uh, yeah, fast forwarding along, um, I met a guy that, I don't know why, but he asked me if I climbed SRT. I had no idea what SRT meant. And then I watched him walk up a rope at about a thousand miles an hour with no effort whatsoever. And you know when your eyes just get massive and you go, oh, <laughs> that just changed everything. Yeah. Uh, so then I got a rope runner and a knee ascender, and that was it. <laughs> now um, I'm probably as quick going up a rope as the average guy. And, um, where I still suffer from everybody else is the whole hand over hand thing. You get yourself into a tricky situation trying to do one hand over the top, over the top. That is just the hardest thing. So, you know, you can pull in a little bit, take out the slack, and then you're off again. But at least with SRT, you just pull yourself in. But send us nothing away. You know, just put everything into them big leg muscles. Um, but it's trial by error, isn't it? You find yeah. something, have a go, you realize it just doesn't work or it's not as efficient as something else, and then move on to the next and keep on going until you find something. I noticed uh, on social media sometimes when guys complain about splicing or certain things and you chime in, you kind of say, <laughs> You know, maybe you should try it with one hand, you know, yeah. and it's it's kind of a tongue in cheek way of saying, you know, that's a first world problem. You know? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I see them pop up online. And I, I hear these funny things and uh, I can't help but think, well, at least you're just not putting in as much effort as you probably should be. If a guy with one hand can do it, I'm sure you can do it with two hands. So that leads me to my next question. Um, how has having one arm enhanced your life, do you think? Like, do you have a, a different perspective or something because of that that you use as a secret weapon? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that having one hand's made me better at everything because uh, it's just pushed me forwards. You know, it's given me drive to, to not be the best, but just to be perhaps the best with one hand, which would be the average of two hands. But I just don't need to be the best. I just don't want to be the worst. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely a driving force because uh, I don't like being beaten. Uh, I don't like to see it as like a, an anchor holding me back. You know? yeah. My uh, my dad is very into everything. He would never let me sit behind and have a, chat, a chip on my shoulder. He just pushed me into everything. So he's an amazing dude for that. But uh, oh. what I've gone through my entire life with is just, well, it's there. I'll find a way to do it. And there's very few things that I can't do. Um, a few things that I can't do very well. <laughs> but uh, for the most thing, it's a challenge. Whatever it is, it's just a bit of a challenge. So I've got to get stuck in until I do it, do it, and do it. Uh, well, and I, I remember, quite, I I get remember there. 
I remember the first splicing workshop that you took. And after I was teaching you how to do the whipping on the line, and you're looking around for a place to put your needle down, and instead of sticking it in a piece of rope or something, you just took it and you stuck it in your prosthetic hand and let it sit there and did the next thing, and then you went and took it back, you know? And uh, that that struck me, I mean, as humorous on one level, but as, you know, utilitarian on the other. Yeah, the yeah. poor hand. <laughs> I still do that to this day. It's exactly where I stick my needles as I'm doing stuff. Um, How many uh, hands have you gone through? How many hands? Yeah. In what time scale? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Approximately how many have you gone through in total? Okay, so I'm on my way to 40 years old, and I probably have had 20, 30 hands a year. No, from my teenage years, maybe it's not quite that many. Maybe maybe it's around twenty hands in a year. Wow. Um, but, uh, but that's because I'm a little bit more outgoing and doing than other people, right? When I was in my teenage years, I used to ride bikes, so I'd ride push bikes up and down hills and over jumps. That's what I wanted to do more than anything was ride dirt jumps. Um, so I needed a hand that opens and closes, so I could hold onto my handlebars and do the same as everybody else. So they gave me a hand to do that, only they would last a couple of weeks, three weeks, and then they'd start breaking and wouldn't hold on to the handlebars properly, so then I'd have to get a new hand, and it was just continuous like that. Everything that I've done has always been really bad for my hand. <laughs> um, yeah. Being an arborist has been terrible for my hand, because you don't ever, or I don't ever think about my hand as being like a unit that could feel pain. So think about all the times you've got your silky and you're just whipping epicormic growth and just kind of whipping it off. I like my hand in the way and I'll catch my hand. I don't know if I can get that into it. So at the moment, can you see my zombie hand? I had to put tape on it to hold it back together again. Um, well, I've noticed on your, on your Instagram page, I've noticed a few severed fingers. <laughs> <laughs> there is so a box collection of fingers. That actually brings me to my next question is that do you treat your other hand with deference because it's the only one? Or do you do you beat on that one too? Uh, I would like to say I really look after my other hand, but uh, I, I guess it just takes twice the beating because everything happens with this hand. Everything in life goes with this one hand. It's not just like I've got a dominant hand, I've got an only hand. Right. So <laughs> every hole it goes into, every everything it happens to, um, which does play off in, like, when work finishes. Six o'clock and I come home, it's family time and whatever else. Um, you know, if I've hurt myself at work, I can't just use the other hand to make dinner or to make a coffee. You know, I've got to use the broken hand, the one that's hurt. Um, and this one, no, I don't look after it anywhere near as much as I should. I try and I try and then it falls apart because you go, oh, I just need to do, I just need to... And this silly little things, you know, like... Um, Two days ago, I dropped my silky out the tree, so I tried to catch it. If you had two hands, you'd still be hanging on to something, and I wouldn't have dropped it. But, uh, yeah, I dropped the silky, and I cut the underside of my little finger, um, which hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, but I still have to get on through life. It's not like I can just start using the left hand and doing things with the left hand, right? Um, but, no, I've, I've done so many horrible things to that right hand. It's, it's unbelievable. When I was 14, I fell off the front. I got something caught in the front wheel of my bike, and I went over the handlebars and put my hands out and broke my thumb socket. So I had to spend six weeks with no hands, uh, which was ridiculous. So, yeah, my parents were feeding me. My, my sister used to have to feed me before we went to school. She's five years younger. So I'd get this fork that'd come out. And I'd, uh, yeah, like little sister's word. So, yeah, she'd wind me up with that. But then I'd have to have somebody, I mean, imagine it. I'd have to have somebody take me to the toilet. I had to have somebody come and shower me because I can't do anything. It's absolutely useless. And then that sits in your brain. You go, right, I'll never do that again. And then, uh, whatever it was, two years ago, I was trying to undo a bar nut on a chainsaw that I just sharpened. And I put the chainsaw on the side because uh, the, the scrunch was rounded. So I wanted to put some pressure on it. And I knew it was a bad move before I did it. Uh, and I did it. The rounded spanner slipped and I punched the tooth that I just sharpened and it um, cut the tendon in my little finger, which stopped my whole hand from opening and closing. 
You know, that injury I think you had just had when we first met. Yeah. And you, and you were you took your first splicing course with a, a ligament that was still healing. Yeah. I remember yes. that. I could only just start to move my thing, my little fingers again. Yeah. But that was frustrating because then that was an, as an adult. I have right. no hands and having to have people feed me and deal with me and clean me and do all sorts. So that brings up my next question. Um, what are some of the difficulty you face working in tree care? Uh, because like we always call ourselves industrial athletes, which brings to mind, you know, fit bipeds with both limbs. Um, you know, have people discounted their expectations of you in the beginning, like getting jobs and, and, uh, you know. Not really. I think most people have employed me off the bat just to go, what can you do? <laughs> Let's watch it. Um, and, and being a bit of a fighter about things, uh, yeah, I don't want to get beaten by anything. So uh, if somebody will give me the opportunity, then I'm all about it. I'm 110% in every time. Um, so most people, they're, they're, yeah, the majority of people that I've worked for have all been decent folk. Um, and they've kind of just opened the door and just said, go for it. Whatever you can't do, we'll work out and we'll find a way around and you know, we'll work something else out. That's beautiful about tree care, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, most people have been so, so tight like family that whatever it is that I look like I am slightly struggling with, they're there instantly to help. <laughs> whatever it is, they're there on me, ready to help. Which is frustrating so, sometimes. So with that fighter mentality when you're younger and um, more flexible and stuff, has <laughs> as you've aged, you're 30, what would you say, 38, 37? 38. 38. Um, has that changed your um, approach to tree care and tree work? Um, yes. The older I get, the more I think about, you know, the well, I can't do this as fast, I can't lift as heavy, I can't push as hard. Yeah, you can feel all them things breaking down. So you have to start using your nugget instead. Yep. Uh, so it's a little bit more brain power than what it is just muscling things out. And now I realize that I've nothing to prove, absolutely nothing to prove to anybody. Now, would, this you is say, a would you say that you've embraced mentoring others more now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I totally have. So there's more of a shift from the individual performance to the group performance. Now I'm all about everybody else. Yeah. I've kind of had my moment, you know, I've, I've proved myself to myself, you know, I found myself and I've proved to the people that I needed to prove to, you know, what I've done. I'll still take on a, you know, a competition with anybody about anything, but uh, I've kind of proved what I need to. So now I'm kind of just passing on that knowledge because I just take it in. I've spent such a long time just taking in everything from everybody, working out the good from the bad. Now it's time to share. I see problems with other things, and I'm there instantly trying to help somebody else. Did but it's um, shift into mentoring for sure. Did that realization come like all at once, or was it gradual? Was there a day that just like all of a sudden you were like, you know what? I'm a mentor. <laughs> or I want to be a mentor, or was it just gradual and it's kind of come in, come in naturally? I think it has just come in naturally. I think I've always had a little bit of a kind of teacher about me. Um, back in the UK, we used to have a willow farm. So we used to grow willow plants, coppice them every year, and then we'd go around to schools and I'd teach kids how to make things out of willow. Mm. Um, so I've always had this very kind of almost childish mentality. Um, so I get on with little kids absolutely perfect. Um, making fun things, being arts and crafts, love that. Um, so being able to share that, I, I guess I have the personality that kids are just drawn to. I got told yesterday I have priest face. Um, people are just drawn to me. And they, yeah. I yeah. think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's true. You have a you have a really good countenance. You're a good listener. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, I have people all the time come up to me and start talking to me about anything and everything. So it must be something about perhaps this beautiful ginger beard. <laughs> it just draws them in. But that kind of teacher element, I've always had something in me that's just a sharer. Um, maybe I didn't know what it was so much while I was younger and doing it. 
but now that I'm older and can think about it and start to process why, how, where, how can I move on and do it more and make it more of a thing. Yeah. And yeah, the word mentor. It took some time having to think about the word mentor, passing it on. Like, I'm going to look after you and bring you up to a safer level or a better level of where you are. Yeah. Um, I'm really pleased that you're embracing that because I think you have a lot to offer. Oh, I hope so. Oh. I hope it's good. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to ask you now is um, who were your early – like? There's, there's times in your life, in your career, who were your early mentors? Who were your midlife mentors? And who were your later mentors? Oh. Because you have different lessons to learn in all phases of life. So who formed your, who was a mentor that formed your early uh, kind of personal development? And then midlife and then later on when you're more mature. Interesting. So... As a, as a youngster, that would be my dad. Um, always look up to him. Till I was about 15, because he's only five foot five. You can look down with him. But yeah, he's an absolute top dude. And he's 110% into everything. Whatever it is, he's there and he's on it and he's doing it. So that's kind of what you look up to and go, well, that's what I'm going to aim for. Yeah. I must have it me too. So that one. The midlife bit, the kind of teenage to 20-something or other. Um, maybe he's less of a mentor and just more of a kind of free spirit. So, uh, that was just a time to enjoy being young and, yeah, enjoy the life. <laughs> Have a youth the same as everybody else, I guess. Yeah. Um, but then after that, when I went to college, there's one of my tutors, uh, Brian Rogers, Who's an amazing dude. Such an amazing dude. There's, there's few people on the planet that I would grab a hold of and hug them until an uncomfortable moment. Um, and then he's in that category. He's just such an amazing dude. His outlook on life and just the way that he pointed in directions and just, uh, there was never a kind of, you must do this. It's, well, this is your options. Just think about what you're going to do. There's so many things that he said that just sunk in. He's went, oh, that makes sense. It's like a dude that's done life and he's come back to say, I've done it. What you're about to do is a terrible decision. Let me help you with a bit of, you know, magic. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that he was my mentor from college all the way through. And then uh, you. <laughs> After, I'm going to say that my later life mentor is you. Having, a, having that time with you in the Spice Bus, uh, talking to you and spending time with you and just, yeah, the, the bits that you've made me feel, the way that you've made me feel. Um, yeah. So you're my later life mentor. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. <laughs> mm. Well, there's kindred, there's kindred stuff going on there. So thank you very much. Um, so can you tell our audience what you're doing now? What are you working on now? And what's next for Martin Penrose? Like, sure. <laughs> there is so I much know. going on. Don't share anything you don't want to, but we'd love to know, you know, what you're what you're doing. Are you in transition? What's happening? Well, up until a short while ago, I'd been working for a tree firm in Vancouver, um, which was a lot of fun. It taught me many, many things, and I met quite a few friends through it, and I got to meet the kind of the Vancouver industry. Um, but then, as I left the tree firm, and I've moved into like, a different role now. So now I work for two different companies. Um, I work for, I still keep my finger in the arborist trade, so on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, I work for a tree company called Divine Arboriculture Solutions, my friend Tiger. Um, and then on Monday to Friday, and a Saturday, and a Sunday, and any hours into the evening, the early morning, um, I work for a tree shop called New Greens. Um, and for them, I started off as being a splicer. So I started my own company being dark art splicing. Um, so that becomes a rope department to new groups. And then, as I realized that I just absolutely loved the store, I just got involved in everything I could. And my boss there, Will, is the most amazing boss. Um, give me the keys and the code to the shop. He said, whatever you want, man. You just go and enjoy it. Uh, all this wall of shiny stuff, you just do something with it. And like a kid in a candy store, your eyes light up. You're like, really? <laughs> what an opportunity. That's wonderful. 
Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, as he is the best boss in the world, he then bought me a sewing machine, um, a rope bar tacking machine. Said, uh, work it out. Whatever you want, man. So now I hand splice, a machine splice. I've got a shop full of tools to play with. Um, so in the shop, I've uh, started turning it around. What I want to make is I want to make some sort of um, Valhalla for tree guys. You know, I want to make a, a, a community. I want Vancouver's community, or Vancouver's the wider community, um, to come and play in the shop. So my sewing room upstairs is going to be like a community-ish centre um, where we're going to have future things. Everyone will find out about it, I'm sure, shortly. But there's a whole load going on up there. But all the downstairs where I've set up all the rope, we've attached all some logs onto the roof. So I want to make that into like a, a visual classroom. So that when people come in, they're not just looking at a bit of rope on a wall. They're looking at how a sling's set up and how it's you know, redirected into another pulley and how different bits of gear work. Um, so I want to turn that into a bit of a classroom feel. Um, but there's so many different little bits and pieces that I can do and am going to with the shop. Um, so I guess, yeah. Keep your eyes peeled on my Instagram or the Facebook or the it website. Sounds like, it sounds like you're really in your element and you found a real home there. Oh, like, dude. All the, all the information you've gathered over the years and the effort you've put out has kind of gelled into one thing. I'm oh, really absolutely. happy for you. That's so cool. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, yeah, everything's just come together. And it's come together into the most perfect little kind of life. Um, well, you could hardly call it a job when you enjoy going there, right? Absolutely. When the bosses start saying it's time to go home. <laughs> I'll be coming out to Westbur to do a splicing workshop and visiting the Samson factory with the group. And I, I want to spend uh, two or three or four days with you in the shop, hanging out and, and visiting. So yeah, I'm okay. super excited. I can't that wait to see sick. what you've done. So <laughs> I can't wait to show you. Uh. <laughs> All right, so I got a couple other questions for you. We're uh, headed up on 32 minutes, so um, wow, pretty. Yeah, I want to I want to wrap it up before uh, 45 or an hour goes by. So um, let's see. So how do you feel about one-handed chainsaw use? <laughs> well <laughs> having never two-handed a chainsaw in 10 years <laughs> but do you um do you put your prosthetic hand on the on the brake and on the bar how do you do it so i do have two hands um i've got this one which is my waving hand this is my everyday hand uh if i'm only going to be climbing and using the top handle i'll use this one because it and you see it's got like the, the thumb first finger, so that'll yep. sit on the top handle. Um, so it's just a pressure to push forwards. Yep. Uh, if I'm going to use a, a back handle saw on the ground or so, then I'll swap hands to a hand uh, that I ride bikes with, so it opens and closes like this. Um, that way I can hold on to the saw. I can rotate the, hand, uh, the saw in my hand so I can put the brake on. I have to take my right hand off the accelerator to take the brake back off again. Yeah. Um, but as for using one hand in the chainsaw, I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask on a safety <laughs> note. Um, do I think it's right? No. Do I think that I can get away with it? Ah, I've had quite a lot of practice. Yeah. Uh, well, show me, show me your uh, prosthetic hand again. <laughs> so, so yeah. This one's got all the fingers. <laughs> now, if your hands are, if your hand is disposable, I guess it's okay to get away with it. So, well, there, there's a the thing, right? Because most of the accidents with the with one hand and a top handle is where you're holding onto something and you cut the other hand. If so, I cut the other hand, it's going to be very funny when my fingers land on the floor in front of the groundy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just carry on. That's it. If you cut your fingers off, well, you probably won't carry on. No. <laughs> Um, but it, it's certain things. It's what I've found with the one hand in is that my elbow and my wrist, because of the vibrations hanging it out and taking all of the load of the saw moving, um, they become something else, you know, because I'm always one hand in. Whereas if you can two hand, you're taking 50% of the weight and the vibration, you're shaking all that through your, your whole body, right? So I guess not too many people have that issue either. Oh. So you have, you have uh, like a concentrated Renault syndrome? going on in your in your right hand 
Oh, I have all sorts going on in that poor right hand. I, I've yeah. done a number of hours on a hedge trimmer, and I believe that the hedge trimmer is probably the worst tool to use for the whole uh, hand and arm vibration syndrome and everything else. I use a hedge trimmer for any more than about half an hour now. My elbow, my forearm, and my wrist just become you know, painful, horribly yeah. painful. Um, and after quite a number of hours on a chainsaw, I'll get the same sort of thing. Um, but just, hello, can you see my elbow in that shot there? I do see it. <laughs> Pulling over a chainsaw in the tree, and I pulled my arm back and elbowed the tree. So I grew this big, fat, juicy sack at the end. Um, and like any good bloke, I said, uh, the best medical treatment for that is just to leave it and ignore it. So that's how what I did. Years, how many years ago was that? Oh, that was about three months ago. Oh, okay. And then after about a month and a half, it disappeared. It was like, ha, huh, I told you all, because everyone said, go to the doctor, get it seen. Ah, it'll be fine. And it disappeared. And then I went and banged my elbow again, and within seconds, it just exploded and turned into this massive kind of Popeye elbow again. Oh, uh, boy. So this time, I'm going to go and see some uh, yeah, some medicals and get that done. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, but sorry, going back to the one hand in there, I won't, anybody that I teach, I won't let them one hand. It's not going to happen. I am going to shout at them, I'm going to tell them, and I'm going to explain to them that obviously I'm not the best person to tell you, and I'm very sorry for that. This is the way that I can only do it. You, on the other hand, have a choice. You have an option. And the safest option is always two hands. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Um, anyone I'm teaching, I'll shout at them. Uh, it, it won't happen. It soars off. I'll have a seat, shout, yeah, and then we're back to it. Um, Good. I don't... Thank you. I think that's actually a really important um, lesson, especially coming from you. You know, I think it's. I think that's a. It's a sobering thought, and mm. I think um, the the way that you have the message to offer the. the the effort that you put in at, at overcoming this um, makes people think a little bit. And so yeah. I, I super appreciate your take on that. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Well, I hope nobody looks at my Instagram account and goes, actually, one hand and a chainsaw looks great because um, all my pictures are generally funny. Uh, I'm a funny person. I quite enjoy a laugh all day, every day. Um, that's why I like to keep it to it. Hopefully nobody looks at my picture and goes, ah, it doesn't matter, I could do that with one hand. <laughs> it took a long time to get to this point doing it with one hand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not the easiest thing. Um, I think the the whole one hand and the chainsaw being dangerous and such, for what we don't mention too much is that the most dangerous saw in arboriculture is the silky. That thing is so sharp, you give it so little respect. Uh, it will cut through anything. Uh, a new silky blade? Yeah, that's a silent assassin, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. I have mine on my leg. Just so it's there, and I can always kind of reach it. All my silky sit on my leg, on a leg strap. But I quite often find myself in some sort of contorted place. You're stretching through your bridge, and you whip that silky out. And you whip it out that quick through your bridge, and, yeah, your rope bridge is gone. Uh, it disappears. You're never going to bring chainsaw through your bridge, are you? Um you cut through your bridge, and uh, that's the emergency exit. And, uh, yeah, that's the one that we should probably be saying, well, let's keep an eye out for the silkies. You know, they really do the damage. Yeah. So that's about it. Um, I have some other questions, but I think we're running, you know, right on time here. Um, I'd like to uh, have you tell us about your Instagram and your company name, your website, so that we get a plug for that stuff so people know how to find you. Oh, absolutely. So on Instagram, I am one underscore armed underscore arb. Um, I think I'm the only one armed arb on there. So, yeah, you'll see all sorts of silly pictures. Um, please don't take any of them seriously. It's only for a giggle. Um, my splicing company is Dark Art Splicing, um, which I'm Yale qualified and I am insured and I have broke test everything in all sorts of manners. I really found fun in brake testing. Um, I work for a company called New Greens. I'm there quite through, quite often through the week. 
I'll be on Facebook answering all the new green questions. So anybody that wants to come in store and talk to me or online, I've got a wealth of information. If you just want to know something without any pressure of buying something, talk to me, text me, email me, phone me at the shop, whatever you like. Um, so is it dark, darkarts.com? Is there a website? Uh, Dark Art Splicing is actually part of the New Greens website. And as I do the website as well, it's my fault that I haven't kept up to date and uh, <laughs> made that page a little bit better. A little bit of harassment for some people, and, yeah, I'll get that online and get it all good. So is it NU Greens? That's right, NU dot Greens. Uh, NewGreensStore.com. NewGreensStore.com. Excellent. Absolutely. All right. yeah. I'd love to hear from anybody that wants to, yeah, have a chat. You just want to talk treats, call me. And you're Yale certified, but don't forget you have two FIDS and Fibers certifications as well. They're the ones that count. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that mean something. I love hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> the Yale right. ones are good on the wall. The FIDS and Fibers one, that's the one that means something, right? Yeah. It means something to me. <laughs> uh, dude, yeah, just before we do disappear, I'm sure I speak for a million people around the planet that have listened to you talk, you've been around you, but thank you so much for everything that you've done for me and for everybody else in teaching the splicing, the safety, the, everything, the love that you give to people. And yeah, I, I love it. Thank you so much for all of that. It's my pleasure, friend. That's what I'm here for. So, um,. Thanks a lot, Martin. I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody, and we'll stop the recording. All right? Um, thank you very much, everyone, for hanging in there. This is uh, 40 minutes out of your life. I hope you enjoyed talking to Martin. Um, please look him up, uh, and keep looking for new Growth Ring podcasts and videos coming out. Um, we'll see you next time. Be safe till then. All right. Bye now. All right, dude. We're uh, we're off the recording, and we're uh, we're still on the phone. Perfect. There we go. Yeah, that worked out nice, eh? Yeah, that, that was we stayed good the whole time. The audio sounded good. It didn't break up. We didn't have any Wi-Fi problems. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's a much better signal than back at the shop. Yeah, absolutely. Very so good. it ended up being uh, 42 minutes. Wow. That time goes really quick, eh? <laughs> I've been thinking about this with my own kind of podcast series and how much how much conversation you really could put into time. Because yeah, sometimes you have a conversation with somebody and it's minutes. <laughs> and then you're like, run out of things to say. <laughs> well, um, I think it helps. I sat down and created, you know, a list of questions. And um, I really tried to get in touch with, um, what I wanted to know about you and what I thought other people would like to know as well, you know. So I, I tried to look at it from the point of view. Like whenever I tell somebody about you, I, I tell them these things to kind of say, this is what he means to me. So I wanted to hear that stuff in your, you know, <laughs> own words. So oh, bless you. I think that makes the biggest difference. Yeah. You know. I think so. I think so. Well, I hope so. <laughs> All right. So what I'll do is things now and go uh, what did i say <laughs> what time is it it's 10 o'clock here probably what i'll do is um i'll let this thing cook because it's compiling the video now yeah. or the, the podcast now I'll try to post that up on uh youtube tonight i'll send you a link oh perfect hey mark oh uh, yeah it's, 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 this is my wife michelle <laughs> Hi, hi. I'm just coming from school. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Wait, you just missed out on being in the podcast, eh? Oh, oh I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle is not into trees or technology or podcasts. No. <laughs> it's for well, that, That's okay. We're saving lives. I'm sure she's into that. I don't know. Are you saving his? <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. It's not so bad. Yeah. As Coops at Yes, Coops at Chew. Yeah, right, no, if you're yeah. pissed because you're going to have to uh, um, uh, process 42 minutes on Anchor, eh? Yeah, and on YouTube. It's going to take hours, I'm sure. 
Oh, is it? Yeah. I've not even really thought the upload to YouTube. Yeah, yeah that'll so be big. Got a video. I'll start the upload now and go to bed, and it'll be done by morning, so. Perfect. <laughs> Dude, did All the right, best. Buddy. You <laughs> did a great job. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for... <laughs> a bit ahead. <laughs> thank you for being my first interview. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, it means a lot. Yeah, Thanks we'll stick together. We'll work it through, eh? Absolutely. All right. That's uh, indeed. Okay, have a sweet right. night. I'll talk to you soon, bud. Love you, man. I love you too. Ciao. Bye. All of them.